This is the treasure ledge of the reef, said Jim Tom suddenly. Here too, he went on, death hides and waits. And he paused for a moment. Jimmy's answer was to slip out of his unbleached cotton shirt and trousers and stand poised like a red bronze statue of speed with the long flat muscles rippling over his lithe body and graceful limbs. It was here that your father died, said Jim Tom again. I was lying watching him search among the sponges, he went on after a pause, when before my very eyes he was gone. My only son, he went on, his voice rising as he harked back over forgotten years, in the jaws of one of those accursed sculpins of the deep water, a tonu ten feet long. And then, asked Jimmy Tom, very softly, as the old man stopped, And then, went on the old man fiercely, everything went red around me. I gripped my spike and dove and swam as I never swam before, down to that lurking, ugly demon. And the second I was on him, and stabbed him with all my might, once, twice, three times, until dying, he went off the ledge into the depths below, and I followed him beyond, to where no man may dare to swim. There he died." As his hateful mouth gaped, I dragged out your father by the arm and brought him back to the top. But when I climbed with him into the canoe, he was dead. And I was, as you see me now, dead too from the waist down. All the rest of that day and all the night beyond and the next day, I paddled and paddled until we came home. My dead son and I, no, no, went on the old man, Let us try the safer side of the reef. For answer, Jimmy Tom quickly fastened in place the outriggers on either side of the canoe, which made it firm and safe to dive from. Around his neck, he slipped the towel, the wide-mouthed bag with a drawstring into which a sponge diver thrusts his findings. Around his neck, too, he hung the spike, a double-pointed stick two feet long of black palm wood hard and heavy as iron. Then, standing on the bow seat, he filled his great lungs again and again until every air cell was opened. The old man looked at him proudly. You are my blood, he said softly. Go with God. I will watch above you and be your guard. Forget not to look up at me, and, if I signal, come back to me fast, for I cannot go to you, he finished sadly. The young man gave a brief nod and, filling his lungs until his chest stood out like a square box, dived high into the air with that jackknife dive which was invented by sponge divers, and, striking the water clean as the point of a dropped knife, he shot down toward the beautiful depths below. Into his lithe body rushed and pulsed the power and energy of the great swinging sea as he swam through the air clear water toward a thicket of gargonias. What are you doing? I'm recording something for school. (laughs) Can you stay quiet so I can finish? Okay. Maybe you should go downstairs and play. No? Okay. Which waved against the white sand like a bed of poppies. In 30 seconds, he was 20 fathoms down where the pressure of 70 pounds to the square inch would have numbed and crippled an ordinary swimmer, but meant nothing to his steel-strong body, hardened to the depths by years of deep diving. Even as he reached the gleaming thicket, he saw, with a great throb of delight, a soft, golden-brown tuft of silk sponge hidden beneath the living branches. The silk sponge is to sponges in the sea what the silver fox is to trappers on the land, and the whole year's output from all seas is only a few score. With a quick stroke, Jimmy Tom reached the many-colored sea shrub. The moving branches had to be parted carefully with the spike, lest they close and hide beyond finding the silky clump growing within their depths. Even as the boy started to slip over his head the cord from which swung the pointed stick, he looked up to see Jim Tom beckoning frantically for him to return. 
Yet nowhere in the nearby water could he see anything unusual, except a little fish some eight inches long, marked with alternate bands of blue and gold, which came close to him and then turned and swam out to sea. Still, his grandfather beckoned, his face contorted with earnestness. The boy hesitated. An arm's length away lay a fortune. It might well be that never again could he find that exact spot if he went back to the surface now. All this passed through his mind in the same second in which he suddenly plunged his bare arm into the center of the Gorgonia clump without waiting to use the spike, as all cautious sponge divers do. Following the clue of the waving silken end, he grasped a soft mass. Even as he pulled out a silken sponge worth more than its weight in gold, something sharp as steel and brittle as ice pierced his hand deep, and he felt a score of spines break and wrinkle in his flesh like splinters of broken glass. By an ill chance, he had thrust his hand against one of those chestnut burrs of the ocean, a purple-black sea urchin whose villainous spines, like those of a porcupine, pierce deep and break off. Suddenly, his, setting his teeth against the pane, the boy shifted the silky clump of sponge to his other hand and swam for the canoe with all his might. As he rose, he saw his grandfather mouthing the word, Hurry! Every line on his tense face set in an agony of pleading. Even as the boy shot toward the surface, he caught sight once again of the same brilliant little fish returning from deep water. Close behind it, dim at first, but growing more and more distinct as it came, showed a sinister shape, slate gray with yellow-brown stripes, the dreaded tiger shark of deep water convoyed by that little jackal of the sea, the pilot fish. It was fortunate for Jimmy Tom that the tiger shark is not among the swiftest of its family, and that he was halfway to the surface before the cold deadly eyes of that one caught sight of his ascending body. With a rush like a torpedo boat, the 30-foot shock I'm sorry, shark shot toward the straining, speeding figure and reached it just as, with a last desperate effort, Jimmy Tom broke water by the canoe. Only the fact that a shark has to be on its back to bring its play, even, uh, to bring into play its seven rows of triangular sawed edge teeth saved the boy's life. The tiny tick of time which the fish took in turning enabled the old man, with a tremendous heave of his powerful arms, to drag Jimmy Tom bodily over the gunwale, the gunwale just as the fatal jaws snapped shut below him. Well, what, mama, Mommy, what happened? A shark almost bit that boy. Now you have to be quiet while I finish recording, okay? Um, for a long minute, the sea tiger circled the canoe with hungry speed. Then, seeing that his prey had escaped, he swam away, guided as always by the strange pilot fish, which feeds on the scraps of the feast which it finds for its companion. As the shark turned toward deep water, Jimmy Tom sat up from where he had been lying at the bottom of the canoe and grinned cheerfully after his disappearing foe. Then, without a word, he handed Jim Tom the clump of sponge which, throughout his almost dead heat with death, he had held clutched tightly in his left hand. With the same motion, he stretched out his other hand, filled like a pincushion with keen glassy spines from the sea urchin. Not twice in a long lifetime, said his grandfather, have I seen a finer silk sponge Already that sloop, sloop is half paid for. Without further words, he drew from his belt a sharp pointed knife and began the painful process of removing one by one the embedded spines from the boy's right hand before they should begin to fester. He finished this bit of rough and ready surgery by washing out each deep puncture with stinging salt water. When he had entirely finished, 
Jimmy Tom carefully tucked away the sponge in a pocket fastened to the inside. Grayson, I'm recording something. I'm sorry, person listening. When he had entirely finished, Jimmy Tom carefully tucked away the sponge in a pocket fastened to the inside of the canoe and, slipping the wide-mouthed bag again over his neck, stood on the thwart ready for another dive. Dive! 